Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. So glad you guys are here. Whether you're in the room, you're watching online, you are in our outdoor uh, service, CSUB, wherever you're watching from, we are so glad you're here. One more time, will you welcome everybody watching church? Come on. We are in part three of a series that we have called Freedom, and we are going after it this year. How many are going after freedom with us this year, amen? That is more than a series. This is a journey. We're going to experience the most liberating year of our entire life. And and so I hope that if you've missed any of these, you can catch them up online. But there are some foundational truths for us if we are going to walk in freedom, if we're going to access some things that are available for us, then we have to base it on the truth of God's word. Here are two primary truths that we have to understand. The first is this, you and I, we're only as free as the truth we believe. Jesus said that when you abide in his word, you are truly my disciples and you'll know the truth. And that truth has the power to set you free. It's not just the truth that sits in the Bible. It's the truth that I not just know. I, I know it. I believe in it. I abide in it. It's in my heart. It's on my lips. It's I'm going to walk this out. That kind of truth will set you free this year. If you believe it, it there's, there's freedom in the word of God. But you all need to know, listen to me, the devil can't touch you. He's got no authority over your life. Do you guys realize this, child of God? He cannot hurt you or harm you only if you allow him to. Now, I know no one in here is like willingly, purposefully allowing the enemy to hurt them. Like, okay, devil, here's my marriage. Go ahead, take it. Here's, you know, here's, here's my mind. Here's my thoughts. Go ahead and just take it. No one's doing that purposefully or intentionally. So how in the world is, is the devil operating then hurting, harming, and causing chaos in in our life. It's the opposite of the statement I just gave you. It's still true, but it's the opposite. And that is this. When you believe the lie, you enthrone the liar. Jesus called the, the devil the father of lies. So we don't willingly surrender our minds and our marriage and our children and our calling and our, and, our, and our ministries or our businesses and the endeavors that God has put inside of our heart. We don't willingly surrender those things. We just don't walk in and believe the truth of God's word. We believe the lies of the enemy and therefore he has access. In fact, he's enthroned. He's in the authority of our life to steal and kill and destroy whenever we are believing the deception of the enemy. So if this is going to be the year of freedom, then it, it then needs to be the year of truth. That we need to go on a journey of knowing, believing, abiding in the truth of God's word. In, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus calls the devil the thief. This is a very appropriate title, a name for Satan, our adversary who is against us, who, who is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. Now remember, every attack of the enemy against your life is actually to derail your purpose. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get you off the path of God, God's assignment for your life, the victory that is yours, the authority that is yours, the freedom that is yours. He wants to derail that purpose of God in your life. How? He's a thief. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have the life that I've always called you to live. And some of you deep down inside, you know that there's more to this life. You're like, gosh, man, there's just got to be. Yeah, Jesus said, he's come so I can take hold of life that is truly life and live it to the full. Today, we're going to study. I'm so excited for the word of God today. We're going to study an Old Testament story today. Many of you might be familiar with the story. It's a story of David before he ever becomes king. But here's what I titled the message today. Five thieves that rob your freedom. There's five thieves that are right. If the enemy's a thief, we just got to know, we got to know, okay, we're going to name the thief, and then I'm going to teach you um, how to fight and catch a thief. Y'all want to know how to fight and catch a thief? Just the other day, my wife woke up in the middle of the night, and she's like, she's like, Jason, and, and she's looking at her phone. I'm like, she had to say it a few times, man, she's like, Jason, and I'm like, what? And she's, she shows me the camera, and she's like, there's someone here in front, Okay, and we got the ring camera going on, checking out. Um, I, and I look at it, and sure enough, there's like four dudes. They look like bad dudes, you know what I mean? They don't belong, like, these ain't my dudes, okay? And so they're coming out of, they're, come, they're, they're parked in a black car right in front of my house. They all coming out, they're holding liquor, stumbling, stumbling and stuff. I'm like, they ain't my dudes. This ain't none of my dudes. And they walk to the side of my house. Yeah. 
And so, so I immediately, well, I, I got my lockbox, punch in my code, and I came ready, bro. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to catch a thief. <laughs> Come up in my house, I'll catch you a thief. We got, a, we got a different kind of enemy today. Nah, they, they, they weren't coming to my house. You got, they went to the neighbor's house. So I was just like, ah, he can rob there. No, I'm just kidding. There were, it was a party. It was a party. Okay, let me, you got five thieves that are trying to rob your freedom, all right? The enemy's a thief. So, so let me set up the text, the, the, like the Bible text that we're gonna be studying today in a time where Israel was actually being bullied by a neighboring nation, they're constantly at war with this Philistine nation. They were under their thumb at this time. They finally had enough of it and they kind of squared off against the nation against nation. So Israel against Philistine army and they kind of squared off at this place called the Valley of Ella. In those times though, there was this practice of war where a champion would actually fight for you and for the nation. And the way it would work is that it would be like a one-on-one -on -one match and the champion of one side versus the champion of one side. And whoever was defeated and died, that nation would have to submit and surrender to the nation of the champion, that one. The, the problem for Israel is that the Philistines had a bad champion, man. He was just, he was a bad dude. His name Goliath. Y'all probably know this name. Nine, over nine foot tall. This guy was bred for war. He was, he was hand to hand combat was his speciality. Okay. So this guy, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 16, that for 40 days, this Philistine giant came forward every morning and evening and took his stand out there in the valley to be the champion, waiting for another champion. And for 40 days, ain't no one of those Israelites came forward to battle, to be the champion of Israel and to battle. And so 40 days, the Bible says he would taunt them and ridicule them and speak against them. For 40 days, they were living under this oppression of the Philistines, but they were afraid to fight for their freedom against what appeared to be a superior enemy. So let me ask you a few questions to set up this message today in the right context for you. What battle are you putting off? What giant are you tolerating in your life? You know, we can, we can, like that thing, like, you know, if it wasn't there, your life would be so much better. You know what I'm saying? Anyone, that thing that you're procrastinating, dealing with, any professional procrastinators in here? Anyone? <laughs> professional procrastinators that, that you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll fold the clothes later. <laughs> Come on, how many know that word later, right? I'll do the dishes later, yeah. <laughs> I'll do my homework later, yeah. Later is like this magic wand word, right? You just wave it and all of a sudden dishes disappear. The clothes evaporate, you know? That email that you don't want to send or respond to yet just kind of, it, it, it evaporates. The, the hard conversation, the difficult conversation, that difficult person that you, you know you should have and you don't want to deal with and you've been procrastinating on later, just is this magic wand. But it really doesn't, does it? It, it, it just, it, it stays. But we get comfortable with it. We learn to adjust to the giant rather than addressing the giant. Later is not a magic wand. And procrastination is not really even your thief. It's not, it's, not, it's not the enemy. Please hear me. If you're procrastinating, any area of your life that you're procrastinating, you know, it's, it's the byproduct of a thief. It's not the thief. So in any area you are procrastinating, you're, you're tolerating something, I promise you, there is a thief in your life. He's stealing He's killing, he's destroying, he's distracting you and derailing you from the purpose of God. You procrastinate for long enough in that area of your life, you just start faking it like it ain't there. Acting like it's not there. That, that like, like, we're gonna catch the thief today. Turn to your neighbor and, and tell him, I'm gonna catch a thief today. Come on, tell him, don't get out here. Never mind. I'm gonna say something not good in this place. Okay. So at a time when David was anointed, by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of, of Israel. In fact, it happened in the previous chapter. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, he was anointed by Samuel to be the king of Israel, but it would actually take 14 years for him to become the king. So it took 14 years for him to assume the role as king, even though he was already anointed. He had the anointing of a king. 
Okay, and for, so this is where we're going to pick up the story. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 17. It says, One day Jesse, that's his father, said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these ten cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along because they're in the battle. They're older. They're fighting the battle. They're fighting the war. David's still taking care of the sheep that his father told him to take care of. And he says, hey, bring the report back to me how they're doing. Here is the first thief that I want you to see that, that the enemy is, is going to try to steal, kill, and destroy, and derail him from his purpose because David could have easily been like, what the man got me delivering cheese to my brothers when I'm anointed to be king of Israel. Here's, here's the first thief of your freedom. It's, I'm telling you, it's pride. Write it down. Pride. See, pride, we're, we're, some of us, we're not free because we don't want to admit we have an issue in the first place. Pride will cause you to tolerate, to fake, to act like, to put on. Pride will cause you to keep things hidden and concealed and not be honest with others or yourself, but you can't heal what you don't reveal. Pride will rob you of possibilities and, and opportunities because you're too good to deliver cheese. You'll never conquer giants. Come on, somebody. Because you got better things to do. Come on, you got better things to do than do something. You got better things to do than serve on a team. Serve on a team. Man, I'm busy, don't you? I got things, man. I'm a busy man. I'm an important man. You know, there's, sometimes there's some people that like... Um, you know, you're, you're, you're successful. Some of you're, you know, some of you're successful. You got people that look up to you. And then, and, and it's like, well, you got anything other than, you know, greeting on a, on a, a you know, greeting people, parking a car, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm somebody, I'm somebody. And maybe you don't say that, but the reason why you're not serving is because you think you're somebody or you think you're above it. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so I love, like, and, and this, this will happen. Depending on how, the higher you go, the more, the more prone you are to this pride. And, and so there's this, we, we actually have, I love one of our team members. His name is Ryan Brigden. I don't know if you know Ryan Brigden, but he, he serves in our parking lot team. He actually just, he, he started serving. He became the uh, parking lot captain. He leads the team and he leads a homeless outreach team. But he's a, he's a chief in the fire department. He leads multiple people so many so many people and he and he'll tell you like he doesn't serve for them he serves for him yeah. like like it does something to his look serving changes you more than it changes him okay let me give you a, a c.s lewis quote c.s lewis said pride is spiritual cancer it eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense it, it's serving others it changes you more than it changes those people like, like I need to serve because it's this antidote to pride that is so prevalent in every human. And in, in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 16, it says, the pride and arrogance of your heart, it's deceiving you. It is a thief that is robbing you, the deception of the enemy that's robbing you of stepping even onto the battlefield, the possibility and the opportunity. It's actually your obedience in the little things that opens up the door to great things. David was positioned for destiny because he was first a delivery boy. He was faithful as a shepherd in his father's field before he became the shepherd king in his, of his heavenly father's sheep, Israel. Pride is a thief that can rob you of your freedom. And it was a thief that tried to rob you. It's a, it's a thief that, that David had to conquer. Here's the second thief. Let's look at it. Verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, David he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? That's where you're supposed to be. You don't belong here. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch the battle. Now, let me remind you, this Eliab is his oldest brother. And when the prophet Samuel in the previous chapter went to go find the next king to be anointed as the king of Israel, God told him he would come from the house of Jesse. Jesse had multiple brothers. When the prophet came, he lined up all of his brothers except David. David was out in the field singing and frolicking with Jesus. Now we got, and he was like writing psalms and taking care of the, the, the sheep. And, and, and one by one, Samuel went down the line. It's got to be this one. Oh, he looks, that's, that's, he looks good. God says, not him. It's not him. It's not him. So, so he had to at one point come to Eliab. 
and go, it's got to be him. And God said, that's not him. And he was rejected, or at least felt the rejection. Until, until is there any other sons you got? Because God told me to come here. Well, there's that one, David, out in the field with the sheep. Bring him. And when he comes, he sees this is the one God says it is. And he anoints him with oil, pours it from head to toe, and blesses him and anoints him as king. This is all of what his brothers had to experience. Not only their own rejection, but their younger brother getting the blessing. So in that backdrop, this is Eliab going, ah, I know you're, you're just conceited. Has anyone ever tried to check your motives, but in doing so, they unknowingly revealed their own jealousy? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, like they, they try to say something to you, but they didn't realize, but it was actually just a reflection of what was going on in their own heart. This is what's happening to his brother right here. And, and, and there, is, there is an opportunity. The thief is coming and he's, and he's trying to find a window of opportunity to derail David from his purpose to steal, kill, and destroy. Because if he didn't get him with pride, he's going to get him with number two, quarreling. With quarreling, his brother was dead wrong and David could have got baited into the wrong battle. He could have clapped back, how dare you? Who do you think you are? Fine then, don't eat my grilled cheese sandwich. Starve to death for all I care. Okay, I'm not doing nothing wrong. I'm just, I'm being obedient to my father. Here. He could have clapped back, but just because you're right doesn't mean you have to fight. And some of you are letting the thief steal, kill, and destroy in your life because you're fighting the battle of right. And you think that it is your right to declare you're right every time you think you're right. And you got baited into the wrong battle. And the thief is robbing you. David chose not to fight his brothers because he knew the real battle was against Goliath. So, so the reason why some of you might still be in bondage today is because, listen to me, you're finding contentment fighting your brother instead of the courage to fight your giant. Come on, amen with that, Pastor. That was good. That was good. I'll say amen to myself and fine. So, 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 cause, cause here's the, so instead of addressing the unresolved childhood wounds you have, you just engage in constant conflict with your, fa- with your family, blaming them for all your troubles. But the true battle lies in the healing of your deep-seated hurts. You might be engaging in office politics, competing you know, relentlessly with your colleagues, and that may seem like the primary struggle you're dealing with, but beneath the surface, it's your own insecurities. It's your own fear of failure, and you can't get the promotion until you defeat that giant. But we just think it's a lot easier to fight the brother you know than the demons you don't. See, the devil knows he can't defeat you, so his tactic becomes to an attempt to distract you. Listen to me, you can't fight spiritually if you keep fighting physically. Let me say it like this. Stop fighting physical battles when God has called you to fight spiritual wars. You're getting baited in to the wrong battle. The enemy brought you an opportunity, someone wronged you, and you stepped into that thinking that that was the fight, that was the bait. Are y'all with me today? Quarreling. It's a thief of freedom. Ephesians chapter 6, 12 says, for we are not fighting. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. So as long as we're fighting flesh and blood, we're not gonna possess God's anointing to fight against spiritual enemies. Listen to me, guys. Not every battle is worth fighting. You gotta learn how to protect your anointing. Some of y'all wasting the anointing of God on your life, baited into the wrong battles. You got to protect your anointing so you can fight the real battles. Because if you're always drawn into arguing, if you always get baited into gossiping and defending and avenging against those who poke you, you're not going to have any anointing left for the battle, the real spiritual battle. 2 Timothy 2, 24 says, the servant of the Lord must not get baited into the wrong battles. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, even tempered, preserving peace. He must be skilled in teaching. Look what he says. He's got to be patient when poked. When they poke you, when they push your buttons, 
The servant of the Lord can't get baited into that. He must be patient and tolerant when wrong, but they're wrong. How am I wrong if they're wrong? It's, well, I'm telling you, some of you, as a thief, robbing your freedom, because people, when people are wrong, you just can't handle it. You can't handle when they're wrong, because if they're wrong, they, deserve, they need to know. They need to know they're wrong. Uh, it, it, is the thief of quarreling robbing your freedom today? Uh, it, you're, you're, getting, you're getting dragged into and baited into flesh and blood battles when the unseen enemy is taunting you. It's easier to fight him. It's easier to fight her instead of actually going after the real enemy of your soul, the real enemy in the unseen world behind the scenes that he's remaining in your life. David doesn't take the bait, though. He doesn't get sucked into that battle. He's got baited in to fight his, his brother. No, the thief's not going to get me. No, no, not, not pride, not, not, not quarreling. Look at this third thief, though, that tries to come at him. In verse 32, David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, your servant. I'll, I'll go. I'll go. If no one else is going to go and be the champion of Israel, I, I got the anointing of God. I know I, know I can go. Look, look what Saul said, though. Saul replied, you are not able. I don't know if you've ever been told what you're not and you've had people speak things over you and try to label you with something that maybe you were called names are belittled or maybe even it's the voice even in your own head that tells you you are not good enough. You are not smart enough. You are not experienced enough. You are not talented enough. You are not strong enough. Here's the, look, the enemy couldn't get him with pride. The enemy couldn't get him with, with quarreling. Here's the third thief that wants to derail you from your purpose, you guys, wants to, wants to rob you of freedom. Write it down, is doubt. Doubt comes like a thief to rob you of your freedom. The, the devil wants to see, have you see yourself through the lens of what you're not. And the reality is we're gonna go through tough times. We're gonna go through challenges. We're even gonna have failures. But what the enemy does is he takes that snapshot moment. And it's not that you have failed, you are a failure. So you couldn't save your marriage. You couldn't, you know, save your kids. And you couldn't stop doing what you said you stopped doing. Again, that's because you're not good enough. And you're not strong enough. And you ain't got what it takes. And you are not. That is a lie of the devil. Doubt is a thief. And the primary tactic of the father of lies. Satan's been using doubt as a weapon since the garden of Eden, so he's going to continue to use it. Satan wants us to doubt that God's love for us. Satan wants us to doubt God's grace and mercy for us as, as if it could run out, like God still doesn't forgive you and love you. He'll even want you to doubt your salvation, that some of you are like, I don't even know if I really belong. Maybe I just need to stay back because I'm not even worth it. He'll cause you to doubt the word of God, the very promises, the very truth that has the power to set you free. He'll want you to doubt if he's faithful to do, if he's trustworthy to do. David, when he wrote Psalm 23, verse four, he said, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, God. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even when I go through dark times and difficulties, I'm not gonna let it derail me from my purpose. I'm not gonna let the thief of doubt rob me of my purpose. I'm going through the dark valley. Exactly that. I'm not gonna stay here. I'm going through it. I wonder if when he was writing Psalm 23, if, if David was thinking about the valley of Ella where he faced Goliath. I wonder, and we, didn't, we, didn't, we don't get any insight of him having any doubt at all when he faced Goliath. But if I be honest, I would. <laughs> I would. Five foot nine with my shoes on. I like to say I'm five foot nine now. Can I, let me say this. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's the means to overcome it. Can y'all hear me? Just because you doubt doesn't mean you don't have faith. Faith is the very means you need to overcome. Let me give you a little secret about doubt. That shouldn't be a secret. And I think it can set you free from this thief of doubt in your life. Doubt can make faith stronger if you don't hide it. See, doubt is that, that thief that you're tolerating, that you don't want to admit, so you end up faking it and acting like everything's okay, 
when in reality, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's going to work. So instead of leaning into your doubt and saying, God, help me with my unbelief because I'm not sure if I go up against this battle, if I'm actually going to be victorious and leaning in with that with faith and coming out with some freedom. Doubt is something we should wrestle with so your faith can actually be firm and, and secure. When the Bible says, work out your faith and salvation with fear and trembling, that is like to say there's going to be a little bit of, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. We have to learn to be honest about our doubts and face them. David, he didn't let the thief of doubt dominate him. He moved forward. He actually, he actually just started reminding himself of God's faithfulness. In fact, he told, he told Saul, he said, look, I'm, I'm not going to let this thief of doubt rob me from my destiny and my, my freedom. That God's been faithful before, he'll be faithful now. He saved me from a lion, he'll save me now. He saved me from a bear, he'll save me now from this Philistine giant. God did it before, and he'll do it again. So in verse 38, let's continue. Saul says, it's your funeral, kid. No, I'm just kidding. But he goes, he dressed David in his own tunic, and he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastened Saul's armor on him and his sword and the tunic, and he tried walking around because he wasn't used to all that. And he goes, I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off, the Bible says. You got to watch out for what other people are trying to put on you. Because everyone else is doing it like this, right? This is the way everyone else fights. This is, this is the way you go to battle. I mean, when I look on Instagram, that's what she's wearing. There's, here's, here's another thief that will come to try to rob you of your freedom. Number four, comparison. Uh, this, this, but that armor, listen, it wasn't good enough for Saul to defeat the giant. Why did he try to give it to David? If it wasn't good enough for you to go out there, why do you think it's going to be good enough for, for David? I think many times we try to adopt the lifestyles and the values and the customs of the world around us without looking at the outcomes it's actually producing. Listen to me, the world's version of marriage is broken. Don't put that armor on you. The world's version of singleness is baggage. Don't put that armor on you. The world's version of success is insatisfying. Don't put that armor on you. You see, Saul thought David needed his armor, but David, didn't, he didn't need that. It didn't take him long to, to realize, I don't need this. You know why? Because David had spiritual armor. Saul had physical armor. Comparison, though, can easily breed envy when we get, let our thoughts spiral out of control. David knew better to allow the thief of comparison to rob him from freedom. I think he had the words of the prophet Samuel in his set. You know, when he had him lined up, he looks at David. God told him, and I think, I, think, I think Samuel said it out loud, that God says, I don't look at the outward appearance. Man looks out the outward appearance. I see David's heart. And so David knew, I don't need to look like them. I don't need to look like them. I don't need to compare myself with them. David, let, David didn't let that thief of comparison rob him. But Saul wasn't as wise. Th this thief of comparison is, is one of the big downfalls of, of King Saul. Let me show it to you ahead now, peeking ahead in the story in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Sorry, spoiler alert. David actually defeats Goliath. If you didn't know that, I'm really sorry to like spoil the story for you. But, but he, he defeats him, and, and Saul recruits him into his army. And this is, this is what it says. Saul dressed, uh, let me go, no, here it is. 1 Samuel 18, 6 and 9. Whatever Saul gave David to do, he did it. And he did it well. So well that Saul put him in charge of his military operations. Everybody, both the people in general and Saul's servants, approved of and admired David's leadership. But look what it says. This made Saul angry, very angry. And he took it as a personal insult. So instead of celebrating David's success, instead of celebrating the kingdom is advancing, he allowed the thief of comparison to rob him of his freedom. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that because of the thief of pride that he allowed in his life, Saul, the thief of comparison and rebellion, that he opened his life to a demonic spirit of depression and, and, and fear. That there was a, the Bible says, a, an evil spirit of depression and fear came upon Saul. Why? Because he opened the door. He enthroned the liar inside of his life. I love what Bob Goff says. He says, we won't get distracted by comparison if we're captivated with purpose. When you know who you are and what God has called you to do, you don't try to look like or do it like anybody else. 
I know who I am. I know my purpose. I don't need to do it like them or look like them. I'm, I'm going to be who God has called me to be. This is so central to who we are at Discovery Church. It's, it's why we named the church Discovery. Our, our, our vision is to help people discover purpose by leading them to love God, find freedom, love each other, and change the world. We believe that your purpose is so powerful that when you discover it, my goodness, it'll set you free from the whole competition and comparison and pursuits of, of this world that you're getting tangled up in. We, we, we continue the story uh, here, and David takes off the army, the armor of, of, of Saul, takes it off, and he steps onto the battlefield. Verse 43, Goliath said to David, David finally stepping out as a champion of Israel on the battlefield, am I a dog? that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Here's another thief that, that, that'll come to try to rob you of your freedom. Write it down, this last one is fear. Fear is a thief. Fear is a liar that will rob you. If you listen to him, it'll rob you of your freedom, your, freedom, your peace. Fear is so crippling and controlling. No wonder it's like one of the primary tactics of Satan that he uses to grab hold of us. Fear of failure. Fear of not measuring up. Fear of not doing or being enough. Some of you today, you've allowed fear. You've tolerated fear in your life, and it's robbed you of your peace it's robbed you of your, your freedom, and it's time. Listen, it's time to be free in Jesus' name. We're catching that thief today. Amen. I'm going to show you how to catch that thief today. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, God has not given me that spirit of fear. That does not come from God. I'm not tolerating it in my life. He's given me something to overcome. Power, love, and sound mind. I don't need to live with this. I don't need to tolerate this fear in my life. I love what Joyce Meyer says. She says, courage is fear. You didn't know that, right? Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is fear that said its prayers and decided to go forward anyway. Man, I love that. Just do it afraid. Don't act like, don't, don't act like you're not afraid. No, 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 just do it afraid. The thoughts or feelings of fear are nothing more than the enemy's attempt to distract us from God and his will for our life. Satan wants you to stop. Satan wants you to slow down. Satan wants to derail you. He wants to decrease your faith in God. He wants you to confuse your calling to control us and keep us bound. Ultimately, he wants you to turn from God's purpose. Turn entirely. That's his ultimate goal. But God moves on our behalf when we, when we focus on him instead of our fears. This is what David does in the story. Let me pause for a moment and, 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 and share with you, though, the freedom fighter's weapons. And I got to do this really quickly. Uh, there's, there's what I'm calling the weapons of our warfare. See, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, not in your notes, you want to write it down. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they have mighty power, divine power to the pulling down of strongholds. See, I, I might go to my lockbox if someone's getting in my backyard, but, but when I'm fighting the unseen world, there's different weapons you need to use. There's four weapons that you need to use, you guys, okay? And I got to give them to you quickly today. Uh, uh, the first one, is prayer and fasting. We started this at the beginning of the year, and I would encourage you to join us. It is a spiritual, not only is it a weapon, it is the battleground that you're supposed to fight. I saw a YouTube video of a, of a snake fighting um, uh, uh, an eagle, an eagle fighting a snake. And, and what the snake does is he grabs, grabs the snake off the ground and takes him up to his domain, takes him up to, his, to, to the air, and he flips him around, and it changes the whole game. See, on the ground, the snake is dominating. The snake is powerful. The snake is venomous. That's his, it's his territory. But in the air, the eagle's powerful, okay? So, so what, what, what do we do? We don't fight the enemy on his turf. You don't fight with carnal weapons of flesh and blood. You have divine weapons. They're not carnal. They're pulling down strongholds. Where's the battlefield? Prayer and fasting is the battlefield. You take the snake up in the air in prayer, and you dominate there, okay? Prayer and fasting. What do we do there in prayer and fasting? Let me give you three other weapons. Number two, the name of Jesus is a weapon. We studied this actually on Christmas Sunday at Discovery. Uh, everything bows to the name of Jesus. There is power and authority in the name of Jesus. The name of God is a mighty tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. We do battle in the name of Jesus. Not in our name. Not in the name of Discovery, name of, of Jason. Not in your name, but in the name of Jesus. Number three, in the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood. It, there is wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12, 11 says that they overcame him. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word 
of their testimony. This is the finality of our victory by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. This is why we can stand pure and justified against every accusation. Everything the thief wants to throw at us is because the blood has cleansed us, okay? This is a weapon of your warfare. And he says the word of their testimony, right? So your last weapon is the sword of the spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, 17 says the sword of the spirit is the word of God. See, I think a lot of Christians today are, are relying way too heavily on their pastors and preachers for the word instead of handling the sword themselves. And, and I know that's our job. It's my job to preach the word and to build you up and disciple you. I get that. It's my, my calling. When I say job, it's my calling. This is who God's created me to be, you guys. That, but, but that does not exempt you from knowing how to handle the sword yourself. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, in fact, there's this, this scary verse, man, verse 22. It says, on the day of the battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear except for Saul and Jonathan. This is, I, I, I fear that we're, we're, we're in this, this similar time in our culture today in the kingdom of God where no one has a sword of the word, but only the preachers and the pastors. Saul and Jonathan, his son, are like the pastors and the leaders and the preachers. Like they got a sword, but everybody else don't know how to hold the sword. And it's, and it's not like it's illegal. And most of the world today, the Bible is not illegal to have. It's legal, but the enemy fights you for your time, that you don't study it, that you don't know it, that you don't memorize it, that you don't meditate on it, that you don't obey and listen to the word of God. Are y'all with me today? Okay. These, these, are, these are weapons. It's, it, you're in a war. It's time to pick up your weapon. So how do we catch them? We know, we know the weapons. We know what the thief looks like. We know where he's robbing. We know the weapons that we have. How do we catch them? Okay, this, this one's easy. I'm gonna give you two steps. Two steps to catch this guy, okay? Number one, speak faith. Speak faith. You gotta say, what are you speaking to the thief? You speak faith in the name of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, and the, with the sword of the spirit, the word of God. This is what uh, David did in 1 Samuel chapter 17. The story continues. David said to the Philistine, he didn't just let him bark and curse at him. I think he interrupted. I think he said, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> Enough, nup, nup. you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defied this day. Then he's just speaking faith now. He just starts declaring, the Lord's going to deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down. Look what he says, and cut off your head. There is a finality of victory that you can have over the things that you're tolerating. God can cut the head that that thing never comes back again. That's what he's saying here. We're never going to have to listen to your taunts anymore. You will never step foot on this battleground and defy the armies of God again. And then he goes on like a gangster and continues. This very day, I'll give your carcass to the Philistine army, the birds and wild animals. The whole world's going to know that there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know it's not by sword or spear, the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's. You got to speak faith. You're speaking your, the word of God, though. It's, it, that's the sword of the spirit. That's the only offensive weapon we have in, in the armory, the armor of God, the spiritual armor. Hebrews 11 and one says it like this. Faith is confidence. Faith is confidence. Faith is confidence. Not in my abilities, not in my strength, not in that armor, not in me. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we don't see. What's the assurance? The assurance, the assurance is in the word of God. In fact, that word, that word assurance, in, in, in Greek, it's, it's hypostatus, and it literally means title deed, that, that the God's word is your title deed. I told you this in, in, in week one, this is what you're supposed to speak faith, but I actually got some title deeds here. Some of y'all need to get a title deed, dude. I got a title deed right here for peace. I got a title. When, when, when the thief of fear tries to come at me, I've already, I've already went to the, to the word. I, already gra I, I know my sword. I know how to do battle. I got a title deed of peace, man. When the enemy tries to come at, come at me, I got Isaiah 26 and three. He will keep in perfect peace if I trust in him and fix my thoughts on him. I, I, got, I got it. I got, I got a title deed, devil. I'm not letting that fear come over me. I, for God has not given me the spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. You, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta grab a title deed. I got another title deed here. Let me see. I got a title deed for, for faith when the, when the thief of doubt tries to come at me. I got, I got a title deed that tells me in Psalm 27, I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It may look like that now, but I'm going to see the goodness of God. Proverbs 3 says, 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to submit to him and he's going to make my path straight. Oh, you got to get a title deed, man. Do you know the word of God? Let me get another title deed. I don't know about you, but I got some title deeds, man. I know my word. I got a title deed when the thief of comparison tries to come and, and, and try to tear me down on what I'm not and tell me what I'm not. I got a title deed of my purpose. I know who I am. First Peter 2, 2 and 9 says, I am a chosen people and a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm God's special possession that I may declare the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his wonderful light. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, Jason. It didn't say that, but I'm putting it in there because that's me. <laughs> Declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, Jason. Not to harm you, Jason. Plans to give you a hope and a future, Jason. I got a title D, devil. Amen. You speak faith. Some of y'all need, need to go to the word of God. Whatever that you've been tolerating in your life, you go to the word of God and you grab the title deed. You do your own study. You grab that sword yourself and you make yourself. In fact, we'll put these, I'll put them online for you, but you need to, because it's what I do, but it doesn't exempt you from grabbing your, your deed, from grabbing your word, from speaking faith. And then once we do that, the, the second step is, is just let's deal with it right now. Write it down like this. Deal with it now stop tolerating it stop faking it you may have given up on it that you could ever live without that or above that or that the head of that thing would ever be cut off maybe you've been procrastinating listen to me greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world first samuel 17 48 it says that the philistine moved closer to attack him but david ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him i love that david he picked up these stones do you know that God didn't, there's nowhere in the Bible that God says, this is how I'm going to defeat him. Your sling and the stone. That's it. Hey, this is what I want you. Here's, here's the battle plan. No, God didn't give him a battle plan. David just went with what he had and what he knew and trusted God. That's it. Some of you are waiting for something else. Maybe, maybe if I just wave this wand later, it'll go away or it'll get easier or there'll be a, an opportune time. I believe in divine timing. I really do. But if you have faith to believe this, listen to me. I believe the time is now. I believe you're at a crossroad in your life and in your faith. I believe you're here on purpose. And I believe that freedom is your right in Christ. That you don't have to tolerate that giant anymore. That God has given you everything you need to be victorious, to do battle. Because the reality is it's battle or bondage. That's it. You don't get another choice. It's either battle this or stay in bondage. Every week I've been sharing, if you're new with us, uh, you can grab this connection card. If it's your first Sunday. We, if you're going on this journey with us, and I do want to invite you on a journey of freedom, I got a declaration on this connection card. I'd love for you to take it out and read it with me. Because some of you are here and you know, like, like it's time, man. I want to be free. I wanna invite you on a journey of freedom and make this declaration with me and with us and let's go on a journey of freedom. Here's the declaration I'm encouraging you, I'm challenging you to make. I commit to wholeheartedly embracing the liberating truths of God's word, dispelling every deceptive chain that seeks to bind me. With unwavering determination, I affirm that freedom is not just a possibility like for other people, but it's for me. It's within my grasp. I declare with confidence and conviction, I can be free. In Jesus' name, I will be free. And I will actively walk in the glorious freedom that awaits. I'm gonna encourage you to go on this journey, to make this declaration. And get free. Get free. It's yours. It can happen. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.